And welcome everyone to another Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord Q&A. We have John Verveke back with us again for his monthly uh, question and answers with us. So thank you so much for being here, John. My pleasure. Glad to be here. So we've got uh, questions already lined up, so I think we'll jump uh, right into it. My name is uh, Brett, by the way, and first up is Struan, who has a question for John. He's been waiting very patiently. <laughs> Hi, John. Um, I've really been enjoying your uh, world, Untangling the World Not of Consciousness series. I just wanted to say that before we started. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, so me... yeah. Um, I hope you guys have Greg on again, by the way. Uh, uh, he's he... coming on tomorrow night. Oh, excellent. So, he's yeah. fantastic. He's fantastic. Yeah, I, I really think that he does better articulating the significance of his theories when he's speaking to you. So I really like the dynamic between you two. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I agree, Strong. I agree. Anyway, so I have a concern. Um, my concern is that building an ontology out of the principle of intelligibility relegates intelligibility to the role of the ground of being, which is to say that I think building an ontology out of intelligibility commits you to an axial age two world grammar. Mm. Um, this is because I think you cannot have intelligibility and have truth expressed in terms of falseness or vice versa. Because if you can express truth in terms of falseness, then your worldview will tolerate, tolerate the claim, the statement is false. And as you probably know, this claim is highly problematic for reasons yeah. pertaining to Godel's incompleteness theorems. Yeah. The way I see it, the only way to escape this problem in one's metaphysics is to make sure that truth and falseness are not expressed in terms of each other. But enacting such a metaphysics faithfully will require you to create an account of a true world and a false world. So insofar as the scientific worldview claims that it both builds its ontology out of intelligibility, as well as casting doubt upon the axial age two world grammar, it casts doubt upon itself. And I don't see you or anyone actually speaking to this gnawing doubt. And perhaps I'm overstating my case, but I think the literal essence of the meaning crisis is exactly this doubt. At the very least, it is quintessentially my experience of the meaning crisis. So with all of the sincerity that I can muster from the most abysmal chasms of my heart, what am I missing here? Oh, well, this is a little bit of a Nietzschean illusion because yeah. he was thinking was abysmal. So, Yeah, no, I, I got the illusion. So, uh, I mean, that, that was a lot fast. And I know you sent me an email about this, and I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, uh, I've been really uh, simultaneously Fair snowed enough. under and then losing time because of my health issues. Um, I will take a look at it. So I'm trying to get the core argument. The core argument is if you build your ontology on off of intelligibility. So the first move that you made is you say that commits you to a two worlds uh, metaphysics. So I'm trying well, to understand what, why that what why does that move follow? Um, because um, if you have something that is intelligible, right, the, the original idea was to say between, right? So you have to have two options to be able to make that distinction. So whatever fundamentally, like if, if you articulate one option in terms of the other option, then it's not really a choice anymore. So the idea of intelligibility in that sense, to me, it becomes self-refuting. And I think this is the problem with Gödel's incompleteness theorem, because it also, like the claim, this statement is false is by definition unintelligible because either like trying to make the decision either way necessarily brings in the paradox where you forced to where you're confronted with the other choice well, i and see so that, that that's I, why i think that okay sorry, sorry. I, I see that but I'm, I'm i'm trying to get um why like what is it about intelligibility there, i feel like there's a missing premise in what's happening here well I, the way that i see it right if you have intelligibility then you have well, let's say the true world and the false world, because that, that, that allow, that's how you choose to arrange the choices. You've got one choice that you want and one choice that you don't want, at the very least. Otherwise, the, the, the idea of a choice isn't meaningful, right? Uh, so, why do, sorry, why does, it, why does it ramify out to two whole worlds? Why can't it be just true and false things within a unified ontology? Well, then doesn't it, doesn't it necessitate that the truth is, or that falseness or truth is, a, like one is a derivative of the other, necessarily then, if it's just one? Because well, otherwise there's... If it's, what, which is just one, if there's one world? Uh, so, so Yeah, what, well, if there's, 
okay so like if if there's one principle to start with right then it's right. it's like a coherent concept like so let's say intelligibility or the ground of being if right. there is only that then there is then there's nothing else then you, you don't need the falseness so there's only truth but if you have truth and falseness if falseness if falseness is not meaningful in its own terms then it must be meaningful in terms of truth which means its own which means that the idea of intelligibility undermines itself the way that i see it but if intelligibility has a um, but if on the other hand for intelligibility to be meaningful then the, 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 the idea of falseness must have its own account and so you can't for example say well the, the, the well, that, that makes no sense to me that movie just made make no sense to me what would it be to say that falsity has its own account without there being intelligibility to the account I don't know what that means <sighs> Well, isn't that my point, saying that the idea of intelligibility commits you to this, this notion of falseness as well as the notion of truth? It commits you, well, it depends what you mean. I mean, the classical answer is it doesn't commit you to the existence of falseness because falseness is a privation. And to understand a privation as the existence of, of something is to actually completely misunderstand the nature of privation. That's like thinking that a fake gun is some kind of special gun when it's no kind of gun at all, right? So, I, in the, in, I well, I, yeah, okay. So I think I can I can answer that. Um, at least the way that I see it, right? The fake gun, this this there still there still has to be an accounting of the illusion itself, or you didn't explain everything. So, so if the, if you oh, wait, 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 an illusion isn't the same thing as uh, like. As, as falsity as privation, right? Illusion is typically that one thing is mistaken for another, right? Um, well, it depends, but I mean... Be because yeah, I mean, there has, this, this, in order for there to be... That's how an illusion differs from falsity. This is exactly the point you're making. There's something that actually exists in an illusion. It's not just a lack or a privation. There's something that exists, but it is mistaken for something else, right? And that's not the same thing as the privation of falsity. I think you still have to have the recognition of a lack. Otherwise, you cannot have the intelligibility. And the recognition of a lack cannot be, cannot be articulated in terms of what you have found. And it's, it's, but, it's that that's kicking me out. But, but, but the recognition of a lack is not the same thing as a lack. That's my reply to you. The recognition yes, of a lack is something itself that is intelligible, even though its referent is something where right there is there is nothing there there's a privation right right but how do you account for that i just if, did if I, have, have... I don't have to account for something that isn't that's what a pure privation is all i have to account for is my ability to recognize the lack but that recognition is not itself a privation so it itself is intelligible and therefore can be accounted for right but so Aren't, aren't you talking about then the lack is not a lack because there's something that is present that is not a lack that is taking the place of the lack? No, because what I'm, that, that is... no, no, I'm saying there's something that's present that right gives me a referent, but we, we like this is Lewis Carroll's point. A referent in terms of a privation is not to refer to anything at all. It is to merely say that the reference fails. So I have something that actually exists. That's the, the state. And there is the recognition of the lack, which is to say that if I try to make a reference, it will actually fail. I can't actually refer to privation. Or you get, the, you get all the weird paradoxes, like I can see nobody on the road, which means there is some special person named nobody on the road. But it's, what I'm saying is uh, that there's no reference there at all. Um, yeah, I have to think about how to articulate this. I, I think the issue, like there's... Uh, <sighs> Um, I know you're familiar with Derrida's uh, differential ontology. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Deleuze. He had a similar idea with respect to, well, he said that the difference was fundamentally, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm mincing my words here, but he basically claimed that, this, that at least historically, the sameness uh, was, was taken as what is and the difference was as taken as what is not. And that was, the, that, that was basically how the, the idea of the grammar was set up so, and how essential ontology basically dominated over differential ontology. Does that make sense? Well, I'm aware. I, yeah, I understand. I don't know. I'm not very familiar with Deleuze. I've only read a little tiny bit of Deleuze. I'm very well right. aware, well, uh, 
well aware of this argument in Derrida, yes. Okay, so, yeah. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the whole thing has been articulated in terms of what is, but there has been no articulation of, in term, of what is not. But it isn't sufficient to say that what is not is just we can just ignore it because it's a privation or a lack. Because the, the, the fact that you can make intelligible, like you can make the world intelligible, means that in, in terms of your own um, interface with the world or whatever, something, yeah. has been, something has been used to take the place of the lack. And that, that very, when you look there, you can only see the lack. You can't see the thing that is making well, the oh, lack. Wait, but wait, but wait, that now sounds to me like you're equivocating between epistemic and metaphysical intelligibility, right? So the fact that something is currently unintelligible to me is an epistemic point, and that's the, right? But that doesn't mean that the thing in itself is unintelligible metaphysically. Why does that follow? That's like saying because I currently don't see something, it's invisible to me, it's invisible per se. But that doesn't follow. Well, the, 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 the issue is that if, I think it, it, it follows with respect when you are making metaphysical claims, whatever claim that you make is contingent upon you as an individual. Whatever, uh, whatever structure makes you... Oh, no, see, that, like this, that's where I want to challenge you, Strong. I think that, that, that's the issue, right? That's just as much uh, being criticized by Derrida, right? Which, I mean, that was Heidegger's critique, and I think Derrida still assumes it, which is to always, always give pre preference to your epistemology over your metaphysics. And the whole point about postmodernism is that they have equal status, right? You could, you should never ultimately privilege one over the other. But, but okay, so I, I agree with that because what I think you see uh, to say that um, when I say that if you if you build your ontology out of uh, intelligibility, right, you, you turn intelligibility as to to the ground, you, it becomes the ground of your being, right? And, and um, but I think that, you see then then you have to talk about your ground of being and the ground of being and that 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 necessarily blurs the lines between epistemology and metaphysics because your your what you could even know in theory possibly is a constraint upon what you could possibly say but i don't know this is probably getting a little bit too in the weeds from from where the question started <laughs> yeah i think so i mean i'd have to think about that last point um um i don't know uh, I, I'd have to think about it. Um, I'm still not quite yeah. getting right of the argument. Uh, I, I have a, I, I, I'm not being dismissive. I hope you don't feel that. Um, I think no, there's something. No, no, not at all. Okay, I think there's something interesting going on here. But um, as of now, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not quite convinced of the point you're making. Um, but yeah, you no, know. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. So, well, I just want to think on it, and and yeah, as I said, I'm, I don't get have any. Uh, uh, inclination that you that you're not giving it uh, full sincerity and in, 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 uh, indulging the question i just want to be better at, at formulating it so that we can actually have a meaningful conversation about it so, good um, good well yeah I'm, I'm mostly happy with the responses okay uh, thank like you the challenging it, it feels like we were, we were wrestling with in the right area at the very least <laughs> well i think so i think we were wrestling in the right area and uh, i felt um you were helping me explicate elements of my thought that i had not explicated before and that's always a valuable thing anyways, regardless of, you know, whether or not you came to a conclusion. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't want to take up too much more time. I just want to thank, thank you because, as I say, this is really something that, that, um, that sincerely, you know, uh, I wouldn't say aggravates, but it's something that, 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 that well, it, it, it consumes a lot of my thinking, let's say. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, I'm reading it right now. So I, if, I, if, I, if I can remember, uh, recommend an expensive and big book to you. Uh, the, the, the Neoplatonist, he's at the very end of the tradition that wrestled with this the most, is Damasius. Uh, so I'm reading Damasius right now. On, uh, hang on a sec. I just want to get the book to make sure it, uh, I refer to it correctly. Just one sec. Okay. And well, John's uh, getting that. So just a reminder that if you have a question, you can queue it up in event text, which is uh, right over the room that we're in. Uh, if you want me to read the question out for you, let me know. Uh, otherwise, you can just let us know that you have a question. And thanks, everyone, for being here. It's great to have so many people. So I've got the book. I just want to mention it for Strawn. <clears throat> it's uh, uh, Damasius, Problems and Solutions Concerning First Principles. And it's translated, uh, Damasius, Problems and Solutions Concerning First Principles. 
and it's translated with an introduction and notes by somebody who I consider one of the foremost scholars of Neoplatonism alive right now. Her name is Sara Abel Rappe. I'll, I'll spell the last name. H-A-B-E-L hyphen Rappe, R-A-P-P-E. -E. Um, so I would recommend Strun taking a look at that. It's a long read, and I'm still myself working my way through it. It's, it represents the culmination of the whole Neoplatonic reflection on um, intelligibility as the um, as you know the best interpretation of the nature of being, um, and so maybe take a look at that, and maybe that'll give us more language for our discussion. Yeah, I'll see if I can get that. It's not a cheap book, unfortunately, uh, but uh, anyways, let me know what you think. I will do that. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Strong, and, and as always, thank you for the very high caliber and sophistication of your questions. Uh, well, I'm happy I can, can uh, be of use in that regard. Very much so. Yeah, thanks, John. And just a, a reminder that you don't have to ask complicated questions. If you have simple questions, no, no. Uh, those those are great, too. Uh, so, you know, if there's something you didn't understand in, in one of the lectures and you just want a clarification, this is, this is the time. This is You have the access now. So please bring your simple and complex uh, questions. Yeah, and also practical questions. If there's something from Meditating with John Verveke or the Wisdom of Hypatia course or even one of the practices, I'm also here to answer those questions. I'm very happy to get those questions. Let's. I want to go from the heights of philosophy into the depths of practice. So, Jules, you have something you'd like to say to John. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Uh, hi, John. How's it going? Good. How are you? Very well. Uh, I'm actually going to go from the heights of Struan's propositional down to the participatory. <coughs> I, I, I just want to... Uh, extend some thanks in a sincere way. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, look, absolutely, John. Uh, I, I'm struggling to get the optimal grip with you, to be honest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, in the sense that I, I think, like many other people in the community, really admire what you're doing, and I say that sincerely and, and without any Thank flattery. You. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I think in particular, uh, what I'm trying to uh, a little bit artfully do is extend a real giving thanks uh, towards you. Um, thank you. you know, perhaps it, oh, go ahead, sorry. Well, I just wanted to say, sorry for interrupting, but I just wanted to uh, say how, how I, I'm such a, yeah, how nourishing to me appreciation and sincere thanks like this is. I really, I really do appreciate it very much. And I don't mean in, I hope not, and it doesn't feel like it's just an ego gratifying way. It really encourages me. Uh, it helps me overcome a lot of personal obstacles I have uh, for this kind of social exposure. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, if I could add to that a little bit. Um, one of the, I think one of the excellent things that you do is that you're willing to expose some of your uh, struggles and, mm -hmm. and to do so in a public way. Um, perhaps it might make us all feel a little bit better to talk about Greg's justification theory and so on. Uh, by which I mean, we're all here publicly. Yep. There is a, there is a, there is a need for people to step out authentically, and that does require courage. Uh, and personally, when I see courage, it it really lifts me up, and I see that in what you're doing. Thank uh, you. And at, at the same time. Um, we're all human and we're trying to, as I said, get the optimal grip and, and not put people up too high and not put them yeah. down too low and yeah. treat each other humanely. But with, that, with all that being said, and I'll stop after this, in particular, your, for want of a better word, stoic willingness to see through the meditation sits with the best of faith, even when you were struggling with the hearing and and different yeah. things was really evident 
where your commitment was. And as I say, Hartfield, thanks. I'm really very blessed by what you do and so are people around me. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jules, very much for saying that. Thank you. Um, I, you touched me uh, quite deeply, um, especially right now because I'm going through another bout where I'm really struggling with the Meniere's. Uh, yeah. But knowing, knowing that that makes a difference uh, to other people uh, helps a lot. And so thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you too, John. Thank you. That, yeah, that was great. And, and thanks for being here, John, you know, through, through, through all of it. Uh, we, we really do appreciate it. And uh, I know, I, I know you, I know you guys do, and that really matters to me. That's why I'm here. So Veloskin has it, has a question next. Hi, John. Um, Hi. I've, I've sort of written this down. Um, so you said at one point in the meditation series that in the process of mindfulness, or in particular mindfulness of the body, I think, yeah. you're using the same capacities used to pick up on others' mental states. I think yes. you said it was insula. Yeah, the insula. Um, yes. Now, this strikes me immediately as having something to do with perspectival knowing. Maybe you, I, I think you actually said so. Yeah. Which I have a little thought about. Sure. So the connection I see between developing bodily awareness and empathy is that it's something like constructing a perspective. So yes. yeah. a crucial part of developing body awareness is knowing where everything is relative to everything else, not merely knowing that it's there. Yes. And the crucial part of developing empathy is the ability to sort of mentally rearrange elements into a particular form yes. in other words you, you uh, empathize with someone when you know where all the elements are of their perspective relative to each other yeah therefore I'm, one might go ahead therefore one might conceive of, of a perspective as like the shape of one's experiences and perspectival knowing is like comprehending that shape so yeah the, the question is could it be that the ability to comprehend and take perspectives is exacted from mechanisms evolved for spatial reasoning or awareness? So I think there's something deeply right about that. Um, and I think I, uh, that I, that's why, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I, I was just naturally saying right to every move you made there. Um, so there's, first of all, there's increasing evidence that uh, uh, spatial awareness has been exacted up into uh, moving through uh, possibility space, moving through counterfactuals. And that um, is definitely seems to trigger areas of uh, the brain that are associated with uh, perspectival knowing. So I think that's on the right track. Um, I think what one of the things that's also going on, what you mentioned was uh, uh, that, you know, um, in spatial movement, things relative to the body. And so in there, and this is kind of like Toad's idea about um, uh, uh, his work on uh, foundational work on embodiment, and also people like Dreyfus and uh, uh, Dreyfus and Taylor and others. Notice how even in spatial navigation, we have things that are like the precursors to first and third person perspective, because in spatial, notice like um, I I can navigate through the world right egocentrically, where I talk about front and back and left and right, but I can also navigate through the world allocentrically, like relative to the North Pole. And that's more like a third person perspective. And actually having both of these, um, uh, uh, Austin, the guy who wrote Zen and the Brain, has shown that even but like even uh, directing your attention, um, like it, so if I, if I focus my attention more inward egocentrically, that'll trigger one part of the brain, whereas I move if I lift my sort of vision up, it tends to put me into the allocentric uh, uh, perspective. And, and it's exactly what you said. It's sort of the, the way you're shaping how things are relevant to each other and positioned to each other. And I think the argument that, that the capacity for a first person perspective and third person perspective is exacted out of egocentric navigation and allocentric navigation, I think that's a very good argument. And that sounds to me very similar to what you're saying. Am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, that's 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 good. Yeah. 
So I think that's basic. I, th uh, you know, this is an argument sort of I, I'm sort of developing, and it's based on the work of people like Toads and other. I think that we're already getting lots of evidence of the acceptation of spatial navigation into more abstract cognition, and I think, yeah, that idea that navigation is inherently about uh, the relevance of th the relevant the relevant positioning of things to each other and to us, and that we have two different ways of doing that egocentrically and allocentrically, I think that sets, that's, that's sort of the foundational machinery that gets exacted up into first person and third person perspective. Very much. Cool. Oh, um, so just a mini question afterwards. Could that then mean that what you call perspectival knowing may, like as a kind of knowing, may actually apply to more than just perspectives in the conventional sense like it's it applies to more than just what we would conventionally call perspectives i, I think so i think uh, and i think there like i think there's something like perspectival knowing even within dramatic altered states of consciousness like the pure consciousness event but it's not a perspective in any standard sense but you still have the here nowness and togetherness that are the sort of central features of a perspective of perspectival knowing but they're not tethered in any kind of, they're no longer tethered to the sort of geometrical structure that we associate with a perspective. Okay, cool. Thanks, John. That was fun. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. All right, so Pedro has a question. Uh, John Pedro is one of our stalwart members of our meditation sangha. And I think he yes. has a meditation question. Please. Uh, hi. Hi, John. Hi. Thank you, for, thank you for being here. My question is, in what comes to the feeling of torpor, uh, that sense of dullness and activity, which hinders one's progress in activities like meditation, studying, reading, and so on, yeah. are there practices you would advise to do? do? Do you think something like breath work could help? Yeah. Breathwork does. Uh, I've done some uh, practice with pranayama um, right before a sit, and um, often it's helpful. Um, I, I think a lot of the moving practices that I taught as part of the course, that's why I, teach, I, I, I myself do them um, before I sit, um, and, and especially moving mindfulness practices uh, that get the cerebellum cortex loop going um, and also um, balance out uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic elements of the autonomic nervous system. So you, you, you won't go into parasympathetic rebound because that's sometimes what causes us to go into that, uh, that, that, that languid state. Um, things like that definitely help very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. You're, you're welcome. Great. And... Next up, Mark, you've got a question. Hello, John. Um, hey, Mark, how are you? I'm doing all right. It's been a rough day, but I'm, uh, I'm feeling good now. So that's all that matters, I guess. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd love to thank you, but Jules just like stole everybody's thunder on thanking John Verveke, yes. like probably till the end of time. So um, that was that was really great. Um, and Jules, Jules uh, pops in and out of here. He's, he's, he's great to talk to. Uh, I have a meditation question. So we were, we were having a conversation uh, last night about East versus West practices and right, whether right. or not they overlap, right? Yeah, yeah, and, good question. Uh, yeah, we were, we were sort of, uh, you know, uh, of course, pro poorly articulating some of the points you've made and, and you know, pointing out some of the contact between uh, East and West and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my problem with this is always like, well, think about, you know, what meditation would look like if the end goal, right, which I still argue is second order effect, uh, were, were, were tried to tried to be gotten at, we'll say, through Western methods, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, what that would look like. And, yeah, it might look a, a lot like so the equivalent of Vipassana as stress relief or something or, or mindfulness as 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 a way to you know alleviate the stress of the world might look a lot like say stoicism and epicureanism for example right or at least some of the there's some practice overlap there um but that right. of course might be harder to measure in a lab but it sort of makes sense that, that they're after the same thing and, and just going at it from a different angle we'll say and then 
you know, that brings me back to this whole thing. I mean, one of the problems that I that I have, I probably expressed it before, is it's hard to get people to meditate. Yep. And first, it's interest level, right? Like, well, how am I going to measure whether or not meditation is working? And, I, you know, again, I argue there's no first order effects, so it's very hard to do. Or not that there's no first order effects, but they vary so much between people that, you know, it's almost impossible for anyone to A, know them all, or B, know which ones you're going to experience or something. Um, and, and, and the second big problem is, you know, people can't sit, right? Because usually I would call them psychological issues, right? Usually they just can't sit by themselves or sit, sit in communion with others, but, but silently or something for some reason. And, sure. and so I'm always looking for ways to get in through the Western traditions rather than the Eastern traditions. And yeah. so because there's a lot of overlap, if you had wanted to start with the Western tradition instead of the Eastern traditions, which of the Western practices do you think would have been the equivalent of, say, like the core four, right, or or something like that? Like, wh which route would you have taken in, and and sort of, and and why, just so that I can get a feeling for for how that might be, uh, you know, reverse engineered or something. Um, I guess the, I, I I don't want to get yeah I, I understand what you're saying, and I'm not accusing you of this at all, Mark, but I don't want to fall into kind of a a, a simplistic perennialism either here so so that, that's on the other side sort of constraining me but um i i think the the core the core thing i would take out of epicureanism and where one thing i would get people to try and start with and because they can do it um while they're taking a walk and it's and it's to and it's deliberately uh pleasurable of course in the way the epicureans meant it is the savoring practice i think the savoring practice is a very good entry point for people uh, to start getting some of what's going on in mindfulness. Um, and, and there is, uh, and some of the empirical work uh, shows, you know, overlap between um, uh, mindfulness practices and savoring. Um, and, and in fact, I think uh, MBSR even uses a savoring practice to try and get people aware of mindfulness. They have people eat raisins and then do the savoring practice as a way of introducing them to mindfulness. So I think there's both practical and um, some empirical evidence uh, that that's a good place to start. And I, well, my experience is that people find the savoring practice uh, very accessible and something that they can start with very, very simply. Um, I think the, 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 the next thing that I might take from stoicism um, is that, because it has this, well, this has been my experience. Now, Mark, I don't have as much, I don't have the same kind of evidence level for this. So this is much more just anecdotal from my teaching. But when I ran, ran the wisdom saying, uh, and I've, I've even noticed this with people who have gone through the meditation course, they find the view from above way more accessible. There's something about uh, the direct spatiality, uh, the, the, the use of the imagination for it, um, and they don't get they don't get quite the same challenges about sitting still. I, I guess because they don't feel like they're being still in the practice. There was one person, in fact, um, you know, who you know he went through the entire course twice, the the meditation course, um, you know, practiced it very deeply, but uh, was really relieved is almost the right word when I taught him the view from above because he just found it way more accessible and practicable. Uh, I think also getting people into this through interpersonal mm -hmm. communication is really important. I think uh, the circling practices uh, that Guy Sensok does um, are mm -hmm. useful. And I think the thing that's very close to that within the tradition, mm -hmm. which comes out of Epicureanism, but it's also very Socratic and Platonic, is the philosophical contemplative companionships. Um, people. So I've got I've, I've did participant observation in a lot of these kind of dialectical uh, practices and people the the sudden increase in social intimacy and the awareness of if you'll allow me a, a turn of phrase the beauty of intelligibility it's a very widely reported finding and it plugs into machinery that's very hard to ignore because. Because we are cultural beings and we're, in, we're, we're so social, interpersonal connections are really intrinsically valued and highly salient to us. Um, in fact, they contribute significantly to meaning in life. So I would say, you know, 
the savoring practices, uh, the view from above, some kind of dialectic practice, probably perhaps beginning with philosophical contemplative companionships. And complement to that is also, I would say, something like Lexio Divina. Again, because people have a text and they're doing it together, especially when you guys are doing the group, that seems to be more accessible to people. It seems to make more sense to them immediately. And they start to uh, pick up on uh, a, a bunch of new skills very readily that they can read for transformation rather than just information. Mark, I'm sort of doing this off, on the, off the top of my head to try and answer you, but that's the, those are sort of the core four I would maybe point people towards. Yeah, I, I like that, John. And so we, you know, we had, um, well, I don't know if you know this, <laughs> sorry, uh, Ben Sanford was here uh, last night. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, I could probably talk to him for three hours. Uh, yeah. easily, right. And the first thing he mentioned was his sit spotting. And I'm yeah. going, that's savoring, right? Yeah. And I was like, that's yeah. savoring. So, so the, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of evidence from, from his work, we'll say yeah. as well, yeah. that, that that's sort of a good place to start or something. Just, and so, yeah, I, no I actually, I thought savoring was going to be the place you were going to start there. And, uh, and, and, and I like the way you laid this out. And I think, uh, I, I think just, you know, I mean, putting that down on paper even is, is worth it, although now I have it in my notes. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I would have some argument with the philosophical because uh, I think that's too advanced for most people. But uh, yeah. the rest so I, of it, I, yeah, I, yeah, I perhaps, resonate with right. deeply. Chicken fingers, right. So yeah, thank you. No. Perhaps, perhaps then, you're, I think you're right. I think the philosophical contemplative companionships um, is too advanced. So... Perhaps something like Guy Sandstock circling, which is much simpler, um, and actually scaffolds for philosophical contemplative companionships, perhaps I would put it there. Uh, the reason why I, I did mention it, but that's not really part of at least the ancient wisdom tradition, uh, but it the ancient Western wisdom tradition. But you could make an argument along the following lines. Uh, Guy make, bases this very strongly on Heidegger, and Heidegger was trying to recapture you know, uh, what was happening in ancient Greece uh, in terms of, you know, their relationship uh, to meaning in life and the good life. So maybe it's it's still a legitimate answer to your question. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I like that. And, and just so you know, I mean, uh, um, uh, when we developed the, the group, uh, the group Lectio, right, we, we took a lot of stuff from circling, basically. Excellent. We had, we had yeah. circling in mind. You could probably see it. I know you have... Uh, I know you have video or something of, of us doing it. You could probably see it in there. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think basically, too, just making containers is really important in this idea of containerization. And then you have a before the container, opening the container, closing the container, and then an after, uh, after sort okay. of talk about what happened after you close the container. That, that ritualization process seems to be really important. But I, I really is. like your answer here. This is this is very in line with, with where, where I think my thinking was going. So I really appreciate you uh, sort of validating this whole uh, this whole idea that you could start from the West first and, and roughly here's how you do it. Thank you. Yeah, I think you can. And Jung, Jung actually argued that we should start from the West rather than from the East. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a different conversation. All right. Thank you. Peaceman has a question he'd like me to read. Hey, John, recently heard the first two episodes of your podcast. Very interesting. And thanks for having a Discord server. Heard some interesting things here. I was wondering if, being at U of Toronto, you ever had any overlap in your work with the Toronto School of Media or its descendants? And is a sub-question, does McLuhan leave a resonance there? Um... So I haven't had any uh, overlap or interaction with the Toronto School of Media, um, which is too bad. Um, I've had some interactions with people who have presented McLuhan's ideas to me. And I used to have an office that was uh, right near where they, they filmed one of the uh, heritage moments about uh, McLuhan. Um, uh, you know, the, the colonnade, the, I guess the U of T stoa um, at UC. And, and so there, there are a bit, of, there's a bit, there's a few personal connections there. But unfortunately, I, I don't really want to say too much about that because I don't have any experience uh, with uh, the, the media school. 
and I don't know McLuhan's work in any great detail. So I'm really hesitant to say anything beyond what I've just said. Sure. And Peaceman had another follow up. What do you think of S.G. Goenka School of Vipassana Meditation, if, if you're aware of it? I'm only very, very, uh, I, I think I read something a long time ago. Um, so I'm not very aware of it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I should answer that. Um, I'm really, I'm really, I'm not confident that my memory is accurate or even relevant. Sure, no problem. And uh, and just so everyone knows, we do have uh, John is is staying here until till eight, so we have have some time. So if you have questions, you can get on the list. Uh, Jules is following up his his statement, and now he has a question about untangling. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. Um, so, John, uh, I watched Cognitive Science Show number five and uh, made a comment. I know you welcomed comments at the beginning of the, uh, the show. So at the moment where you're at with Greg, it, it, it's got me thinking about a talk Chomsky did in, I think it was 2011 mm -hmm. in Oslo, uh, where he was talking about Mysterianism. Yes, and, and he was he was Colin talking McGuire. about. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. The the one of the Colin McGinn is the sort of, you know, uh, uh, spokesperson for that for the new Mysterians. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to try and tie it in with my comment, but also with where he left the hard problem. Um, and I just wanted to see. And I don't want to jump the gun because perhaps you and Greg are going to talk a little bit more about Chomsky. But it just, as you guys continue to go through it, I, it keeps coming up for me. Mm -hmm. And so his, his, his talk, which was excellent, this was before you kind of came onto the scene and yeah. started talking very technically about relevance realization, which is excellent. But Chomsky's sort of ultimate point as you probably know, was, hey, there is no hard problem. Uh, Newton did away with uh, the, the, uh, the body as much as anything else because he kind of uh, made, in, in attempting to make gravity intelligible, he realized, well, okay, I've made it intelligible, but I still don't really get it. As, as he said, I, I feign no hypothesis, etc. cetera. Right, right. Um, so what I might do, what I, I ended up emailing him. Um, that's not to drop names or anything, but he's really good, like yourself, in that he accepts kind of messages from anybody. Wow. And, yeah, well, what, what, he, what he said uh, where, where my head was at when I was listening to him was more about Kant, yeah. in that Kant is saying, well, okay, we do have a structure, like you're saying we have a structure and right. the structure is the 12 categories, right. um, the 12 categories of our understanding. And I asked Chomsky, uh, so didn't he make a pretty good fist of it in terms of saying, well, that's how consciousness happens. That's how we can make things intelligible. And his basic response was, um, Kant was important, but he didn't add too much more than the Neoplatonists. And <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, I went ding, ding, ding. That sounds like John Vivaki. Um So my question was, you, you tied some hard science using polytions. Yep. Multiple um, object tracking. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Doesn't, doesn't polytions work also give weight to Kant's 12 categories? And how does that then relate back to your relevance realization, especially regarding Kant? Okay. Right. So I think it does in a, 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 a way that's important. Uh, why I'm hesitating is I don't know if Greg and I will get into this, um, but I'm, I'm worried about wetting your appetite, but not being able to follow it up too much. But he, the, so 
I'm very much, I mean, the, I'm very, the idea of framing, of course, is ultimately due to Kant, uh, you know, and, um, and I think Fodor, who's probably the greatest protege of Chomsky, uh, made that connection very clear. But I guess I'm more like Kassir and others. I'm more like a neo-Kantian or perhaps also like Schlegel, some of the early post-Kantians. They're often called the early romantics, and I think that's a mistake, in which they differed from Kant in that they thought that the, the categories are not ultimately stable, right? That, and, and you can see how this is going to ramify uh, through other people, ultimately, like Hegel and so forth, right? And so what you have with the neo-Kantians is you have, instead of there being static I'm just thinking that Whitehead also made this point. Instead of there being the static categories, what you have is that the framing is actually is historical. It evolves. It develops. It is right not never once and for all or complete. And uh, people like Schlegel came up with the idea that that means there's always a process of sort of transcending the framing that you have and moving into it. His, that's his famous slogan about uh, the finite always longing for the infinite. And so I see relevance realization as very much in, in, in important ways uh, 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 following in that, that neo-Kantian tradition in that I think um, I'm proposing that there are constraints on how we have to process information in order to avoid combinatorial explosion. And, but the, the, the sort of categorization or uh, sorry, that's the wrong, uh, I want to use constant, more the schematization that is occurring is actually a process that is not like Kant laid it out like a table, but more of a self-organizing system. And if that argument all tracks, then that plugs into the account I'm trying to give of consciousness in terms of this, right, evolving framing that I call relevance realization. I'm sorry, did that make any sense? It does. I, I can see how you're stringing it all together. T to be honest, in, in a sort of reciprocal way, when I sort of thought, well, okay, Kant is is onto something. He's right. able to bridge bridge between strictly empiricist and strictly rationalist accounts yep. for what's going on. It must be uh, going back to Chomsky. It must be like an organ within cognition, right. and these must be the features. So again, extemporaneously, I am just expressing, uh, okay, I thought Kant used reason to critique reason. And right. so he would have logically, I assume, worked backwards to say, well, here's, here's, here's 12... Uh, reasonable uh, features of our cognition that are well argued for. And I don't know, John, whether he referenced Aristotle's categories or not. I'm pretty sure he might have. Yeah, there, he was probably influenced by the scholastic categories, yes. So where I ended up with it was, well, either I'm going to have to get really good at trying to make sense of Kant's 12 categories or someone's going to come up with something a bit easier to understand, which is what you've done. <laughs> it, yeah. it's just yeah go I, mean, ahead. I was going to say there's a sense in which i've taken aristotle and this is the neoplatonic uh, mm -hmm. influence and uh, and used yoraro to basically put aristotle in motion uh, and that changes uh the fundamental way in which you conceive of the schematization process mm -hmm. the framing process do you mean virtual engines yeah very much Okay. Well, I don't want to hog it. That's really interesting. I sort of feel like it's a, it's an open ground a little bit there. Yeah, I, I like I like like I say I I don't think Greg and I'll get into this, but yeah, uh, thank you. I, I I enjoyed I enjoyed exploring these connections with you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Dave has a question that I'm going to read. Do you think that modernity has rendered a lot of many commonly quoted philosophers' ideas either hard to parallel and apply, 
or rendered them completely irrelevant to use in a constructive way? And if so, how do we break these? How do we break things down in a way that can be translated to modernity? Yeah, that's that. So that's a very. I mean, this even comes up in the hermeneutics, right? And um, Gadamer's bridging of horizons because uh, you don't want you don't want to you don't want to reinterpret uh, the ancients anachronistically, uh, but at the same time you don't want to leave them as anachronisms. And so that, that's really hard uh, getting between them. So I, I do a process um, that, you know, is influenced by Gadamer, but also influenced by Heidegger, who of course influenced Gadamer, um, but also Dreyfus and Taylor's. And, and, and that, that process of, uh, of interpreting um, the ancients so that they are relevant again to uh, modernity, which Gadamer calls the bridging of horizons. The, the way I try to modify that is, I try to re I do this process of trying to reverse engineer. I try to get to, um, I try to get to, from the, the their between their metaphysics and their epistemology. I try to get their to their phenomenology. What the what it would be like. What would what would I have to be like in order to see the world the way they're seeing it, in order to realize that pattern of intelligibility? Uh, because regardless of their metaphysics or their epistemology, I'm not saying they should be dismissed. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying about a hermeneutic method. Regardless of that, there is, there is plausibly a shared uh, phenomenology. And then I try to reverse engineer some of the practices that they might have engaged in uh, to both in gender and to explicate and articulate that. And then once I've got the phenomenology and the practice, I try to see how it might transfer functionally into my work or my life. And I get some sense of its, fun so I, I go from the, you know, the intelligibility to the phenomenology to the functionality, see how that's working. And then, and only then, do I then go back and try and understand what the ancients are saying. Um, and so I don't think that that understanding, so I, I like Carrie's word of inventio, which is both to discover and to make. I don't think that if I sort of, sort of spoke to them in this language, they would agree and say, yes, John, that's an accurate interpretation. But I think what I'm doing, therefore, is, sorry, I think what I'm doing is nevertheless, not therefore, I think what I'm doing is nevertheless faithful to them, uh, because... I think in the end, they are more, if they're good philosophers or good thinkers, they're more interested in facilitating the future than they are in, you know, protecting their place in history and in the past. At least um, the philosophers that I, I admired had that orientation. And so I feel when I do that reverse engineering hermeneutics that I'm not doing them a disservice, I'm not right i'm i i i i i like i say i don't know if what i'm doing is you know ultimately accurate would be accurate to them in their historical context probably not but as is what i'm doing faithful to them in bridging horizons and carrying uh what they had to say um into um the the framework within which I and others live. I think that's, that's, um, I think I could defend that position and say with a, with a plausible defense that I am being faithful to them and to their project. And so that is my way of trying to address that issue of not leaving them as anachronisms, but also not just misreading them in a reverse anachronistic manner. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Manuel has a question. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask the question that's uh, queued up in uh, the, what is it? The Western Practices series, no? Because no. um, uh, I've been struggling with this, how do you measure a practice, right? Like, how do you get a feedback? Because everybody's doing a thing and then they're having their own story about it and, and nobody knows yeah. what to pay attention to what what is the valuable 
aspect of, of a practice that we need to generate, right? And, and in a sense, we don't even know yeah. what, what the value part is. So I was I was hoping that you could like enter in some kind of dialogue with me where where we can try to extract what we need to focus on when uh, we're, we're trying to improve practices or, or we're trying to gather information about practices by the people who participated in them. Right. Um, well, I'll, I mean, uh, you've probably heard this part before, so I, I, I foresee that it's probably not sufficient, but it's where I would like to start the dialogue. Um, so I generally say that tr trying to look for uh, the normative standards uh, for the practice within the practice while you're doing it is often uh, a mistake. Uh, this is Dykeman's, you know, I, I often repeat it, it's not altered states of consciousness, but altered traits of character. And so, and, and this is also the same thing you see it in the Epicurean tradition and very much in the Stoic tradition. Uh, people being able to talk about their experience uh, was relegated as relatively it may be useful, but not nearly as important as there being uh, systematic and wide-ranging uh, changes in their behavior. So that's why I typically tell people um, the, the metric for practices are, do you find that in your life you're getting more cognitive flexibility, more insight, um, you're starting to notice self-deception, uh, you're starting to be less reactive, um, you know, uh, 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 that's the kind of thing that I point people towards uh, when I try to give them feedback on how they should evaluate the efficaciousness of their practices. Uh, and, and this has to do with the fact that lots of things are novel to people in the practices, and that, that makes their phenomenology very salient, often very interesting, and people can be um, over-focused on that as opposed to um, the actual changes that might have long-term transformative impact. This is often the case, of, I mean, it's a, it's a common problem across, you know, across scientific psychology. Uh, people often focus on when they're actually going through transformation, they often find the wrong, wrong things sort of initially salient or important um, about what's happening to them. Um, this is why introspection is not a particularly good tool by which you uh, do uh, psychological measurement. So that's where I would start, uh, uh, Manuel. I would start with, uh, you know, and, and it's proverbial, you know, by, by their fruits you shall know them uh, kind of idea. Right. So I, I have one issue with that, right, because you do want to be intentional about the practice, right? And sure. uh, you, you cannot you, wait. Yeah. I was going to say... Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I keep interrupting. My, my fault. Go ahead. You, you cannot wait until, uh, well, whatever, like months of training and then decide whether you did the right or the wrong thing or if it even was valuable, right? So so there needs to be some place in between that we can occupy, right? And when we were talking to Ben Stanford yesterday, he was, we were asking him about integration and he, he was talking about uh, a post- uh, event uh, follow-up, right, with with calmness and 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 the ability to reflect, and then the, the reintegration into the previous normalcy, but with a change in the normalcy, so that there that that signifies a transition element, right? So, so he 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 is intentional about where he he wants to go within some limitations. So maybe that. Uh, so let, let me try and understand. Um, I, I, I do hope that Ben and I get to talk again. Um, I wanted him to tell me a little bit more about um, his ecology of practices. Um, so the idea is uh, you do some, you do some, uh, like you give some space and then you, you do a follow up. Um, what is it like a, a question or a survey with people and see if they can then integrate what happened into the event with sort of their daily life and see if it, uh, it is, is um, dis, uh, restructures how things are normally unfolding for them. Is that, am I understanding it correctly? Yes, right. And he, he used, uh, so reflection, right? So that's that's the calm and, and, yep. and then yep. he also used uh, remembrance in the sense going back 
and and trying to re-engage with the experience in in some way, right? So so mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. that that are two things he, he mentioned. But the the reason I'm mentioning this, right? Because I we we want to start making forms here, for exa- example. Like okay, this this is the the things that that we took from our practice, and and then we want to try and make improvements based on those forms. So so that's a little bit the context I'm asking the question from. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's a good idea. I think follow-up practices uh, uh, like that are helpful as, as again, as long as people, um, so the, 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 the problem you have with follow-up practices is that people start to remember, it's like when people study for the test. So in psychology, one of the problems you can get with this, um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you should just be aware of this challenge is what I'm saying, is that what people will start doing is they will start skewing their practice while they're in the practice so they have something more interesting to say in the follow-up session. Um, And that can be problematic too. Um, So as long as people don't get, yeah, as long as they, 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 they don't get too... Oh, this is hard. As long as they don't get too attached um, to the evaluative aspect of that, you could probably make it work for people. Do you understand the difficulty? I'm, 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 I'm right. Okay. Like, so, so let's let let's drag it out of that realm of problems and just focus. Okay, I want to write my own feedback on the practice. How do I do that? Right. So then, uh, again. If I would say picking up on Ben's notion of integration, which is basically sort of the assimilation part of development, counterbalancing the accommodation, if you have sort of a a, a regular practice of examining your day uh, reflection, does your feedback, can your feedback on the practice fit into the overall? So. One of the things that you should really look for is if you can get integration across different temporal scales. So if you reflect on a practice that you did a day ago, how does that, like what you got out of that, is it integratable with sort of patterns you've seen over the last month or patterns you've seen over the la- or in between over the last couple of weeks than over the last month? Uh, because if it's integrating across time scales, that's generally good evidence that people are on the right track. If it's bouncing around between those different time scales, it means that people are just being salience dilettantes. They're just gravitating to whatever new information is coming out in a practice and treating that as important. Yeah, um, I don't think I have the ability to drag this further but uh, yeah that that's really helpful uh, thanks for that answer and you. Uh, if, if you think of more you can uh, use my question in the q a <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you great so struan has a follow-up he wants another bite at the apple <laughs> <laughs> oh, i was gonna it's sort of a uh, riff of what um Velaskin said since you agreed with him um in your conversation with, uh, in untangling the world not of consciousness with uh, Greg, um, you referenced John Searle, and he he had all sorts of arguments about against unconscious aspectualization, if I'm remembering correctly, right? Yeah, well, uh, not uh, so much arguments. I mean, he uh, he had arguments that led to that point, and then he just stated that aspectualization is dependent on point of view, and point of view is dependent on consciousness. I don't know if there's anything right. other than that arguments drawn. Uh, okay, but fair enough. But I, I'm just thinking, isn't there a similar sort of parallel between that and the notion of formal cause and idea because the notion of idea ultimately also goes back to the notion of vision, which kind of implies consciousness, at least with respect to noesis, right? Uh, so the... Sorry, it, I, I, yeah, I think I get what you're doing. Um, that so the idea of that formal cause is ultimately dependent on um, noesis 
because it formal cause only makes sense to a noetic consciousness? Is it something like that? Yeah, well, the very concept of an idea or an idos, right, is, is what, what the formal cause is built out of, if I understand correctly. Um, I mean, um, Aristotle used Plato's idea, right? To, to, yeah. To create I, I, his idea. Right. Yeah, so Aristotle's word, idea. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. But, but the word idos and video are cognates. So, you know, vision and video, well, actually, I may yeah, have that and, one wrong. And, that, and but, that, that's across the board. We generally have vision metaphors for knowledge. Uh, Sweester shows that it's a cross-cultural phenomenon. Uh, that's right. why we. So, so right. yeah. So to tie in with what 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 you were agreeing with with respect to Veloskin, that's a it's an indication that there's something deeper than just our language going on with respect to the way that we use vision and space. Um, I think so. Yeah. That. Uh, yeah, so, anyway, there's, there's, it's not an argument or anything. I just thought that was interesting. I went to the riff of it and see what you make of it. So, yeah. Well, uh, I, I, think it's, <laughs> I think it's very important. I mean, no, my, my hesitancy wasn't... Uh, I, 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 I thought I was interrupting you. I thought you were going to say more. I think, yeah, I, I, I think there's something deeper uh, than the etymology, which is... The, the, sorry, it, it's... This sometimes bugs me about Heidegger because he's not clear on exactly this point. He makes these etymological arguments, but he seems to be wanting to say that they point to something like you're doing right now, and I am agreeing with you, that's deeper than language. And yet, but then he, but then he comes back and says, you know, that language is the house of being. And so I, I find that, that, that that's the point in Heidegger, the point of essential frustration, which is very difficult uh, because... Um, I think that's one of the reasons why he neglects, he really deeply neglects the whole Neoplatonic tradition for just that reason. Um, okay. Uh, oh, I really want to riff off something that Jules said to you with respect to the 12 categories, well, Kant's 12 categories, because, um, yeah, I think you can rely on four categories, and you call them the propositional, the procedural, the perspectival, and the participatory, and i um, well, that's one of the reasons why I told you that I think that the four, the, the four ways of knowing are kind of to die for um, with respect to like, you know, how the notion of agriculture was to die for when our ancestors literally starved themselves to save the seeds for the next season so that they could plant the new crops, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, that's, is that the origin of that phrase? I didn't know that. That's cool. Uh, well, I don't know, but I mean, that that's how I understand it. You know, it should be if, if it's to die for, well, then it's literally, you know, you're willing to die for it. So... I mean, what what could be more valuable than that, really? If if you or what 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 more claim of value if you're willing to die for it? I mean, that that that's like a limit, as far as I can tell. Sure. That's um, really interesting. That's, I hadn't thought about that. I got to think about that. That's really provocative. You're suggesting that the four ways of knowing are at least functionally analogous uh, to the Kantian categories. That's really interesting. That's well, as, as far as I I'm concerned I, I go even one step further because I kind of associate the propositional with matter, the procedural with energy, the perspectival with space, and the participatory with time. That's, yeah, I like that. That's very cool. I like that. So, yeah, so so th this is, I think this is also to tie back to the first conversation where I really want to, it's not it's not so much knowledge, it's it's the fact that there is language, right? Language has limitations, and the question is, well, like especially if, if because I, I can't imagine information not in a language so the very fact that i'm willing to talk about the universe in terms of a formal cause implies that there's some sort of universal language and so whatever however the world st structures itself um language uh, whatever the features of language are it affects the way that the world and ultimately unfolds itself and so I'm, I'm i'm not trying to look at what do we know so much as i'm trying to look at what can be said as a guide to actually structuring my my ontology, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to think more about that because um, I, I'm worried about how... I, I like what you're doing, by the way, so don't take this as an attempt to refute or anything like that. But, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm worried about the way language is being used here um, because... It, uh, <laughs> It sounds to me like you're using it at a meta level that means something much more encompassing than any possible spoken language, uh, because it would have to be able to uh, provide yeah. the logos for
for any possible information pattern that, and the thing about information with informational realism, right, is it's something like the intelligibility of the relationships between matter and energy, space and time, right? Um, right. So, yeah. Yes. If, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I to allude to earlier, right, the, the essential ontology and the differential ontology, I kind of think the propositional side is the, the essential side and then the perspectival side is the differential side, right? And so if you if you go down that route, then in terms of, it, it's like you say, I don't view language in terms of, you know, like spoken English or whatever. I'm, I'm trying to look at the much deeper level, right? Like what an actual universal language might be like. And so um, where you're talking about the, the information realism and the, and the relationships and everything like that, um, the way that I try and accommodate that is to talk in terms of sameness and difference with respect to the propositional and the perspectival in a, in a, in a tone loss, in a trade-off relationship with one another. Mm, that's interesting. That's interesting because then the notion of language is getting very similar to uh, sort of the late Neoplatonic interpretations of logos. Uh, that sounds very interesting. Okay. Right, but and you can you can sorry, just one last very quick thing, and you can riff off of that because I would say um, then the you've got the static to the dynamic, and the static is structural, and the dynamic is functional, and then very that's much. like the noun to the verb, right? Yeah, yeah. And you, yeah, yeah. you also speak about the adjectival and the adverbial, so you, you're much. also playing with that very much. And very so, much. Yeah. So, so I, I would think of the 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 propositional to the perspectival as the static axis and then the procedural and the participatory as the dynamic and so that's like noun to verb and it's very interesting i like that that's very interesting and, and then and then it, it I, I mean i i am sorry i i genuinely mean that i, I mean it's thought-provoking interesting not just polite interesting it's thought-provoking interesting <laughs> and, and 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 i mean if this is a way of revalorizing and re-articulating and, and reinventio of logos, it could feed back into, because this is ultimately what I care about, it could feed back into dialogos practices of, you know, giving people the actual embodied experience of that, those kinds of relations that were captured by the term uh, logos. And, 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 and I think that's, I think that's right, by the way, because although people talk about it clumsily, because they, they and, and this is not meant to be cruel, it's because they don't have the vocabulary, Larry, they do try to articulate the kinds of things you and I are talking about, and they do sense a sacredness, a profundity, an inexhaustibleness uh, to this kind of experience. So, I, if 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 we if we can if the metaphysics articulates in a way that wraps back that back into the transformative practices and affords the cultivation of wisdom, then that will ratchet up my interest in it even more. Well, yeah, that's very much what I'm interested in doing. Um... I want to uh, bring. Oh, crap! Now I forgot what I wanted to say. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it. Sorry if I can remember. Um, okay. Right, that was great. That, that was very interesting. Thanks, Joanne. And Velaskin, you've got another follow-up, another question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sorry, I'm going back to my first question again as well um so right. this one i'm a lot less certain of so I'm, and i'm sort of i wrote the other one down so i might not be as ordered with this one um <clears throat> so my question is so if in in the kind of instance where you sort of observe someone do something yeah and then you map that onto your body so you can copy them uh -huh. Obviously, the experience of watching someone do something and actually doing it, like the, the let's say the qualia, are very different. But yeah. what you what you've done is you've taken the the shape of the movements and you've copied them, like you've copied that mm -hmm. rather than what you've actually experienced. So, would you say then that like a kind of mini perspective is what you're doing when you're copying, you know, someone's movements to do something? Yeah, I think I, th I think that's right. I'd need to think about it more, uh, but at least prima facie, I think you're right. I think what you're doing is um, you're 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 trying to get at the core structural functional organization behind their behavior. So you, if, if you think of their behavior as 
like a, a, a dynamical sy a system, a way, a self-organized loop with the world. You're not really mimicking that. What you're trying to do is uh, sort of reverse engineer what the virtual engine might be for that. And then you you can emulate that and then let the, the sensory motor loop self-organize within that. And I think in that sense, you're grasping the shape in terms of, right, reverse engineering the set of constraints that shape the possibility space for the sensory motor interaction. And that shaping of the possibility space of the sensory motor interaction is then going to put the parametric shaping on your salience landscaping. And then that's going to give you your, your, your full-blown perspectival knowing. And I think that's how you sort of pick up on uh, other people's imitate, like how you imitate other people. There's increasing evidence that you don't just form a theory of what they're doing, and you're not just directly simulating what you're doing. It's much more indirect. It's much more like this reverse engineering process. That's how you go about imitating somebody. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm not. Basically, I'm wondering. I, I can't quite tell if that was a yes or a kind of. <laughs> Hard, I think maybe. I think okay. no, no, I think it was a yes, uh, but it was a yes that said um, I, I was trying to I was playing with and I hope not in an abusive fashion. I was playing with the mini qualifier of the perspective, and what I was suggesting to you is that I was trying to give you a way of understanding the shape of the perspective. Um, that what that I don't even know if, when you're mimicking other people. If you're quite picking up on a spatial shape as you're picking up more on, I mean, that's probably there. I, I think that's probably there. But I think that what you're actually, what, what, what seems to be doing instead is, right, like I said, we're, you're not just simulating them. Uh, there's been some recent work challenging that. And there's a lot of work challenging the idea that you're just forming a theory about what, what's in their mind. It's more like, you can see in the structure of the behavior the embodiment of certain constraints on how their sensory motor loop is unfolding and then you literally you literally try to embody those same kinds of constraints in your body and then that helps to get the virtual engineering going and then that restructures your salience landscape and that's how you get the other person's perspective so okay. Sounds to me like I'm agreeing with you, but maybe I'm maybe I'm taking I'm playing a little too fast and loose with the notion of shape and a mini perspective. Okay, so I just want to make one or maybe two. Yeah, it was just one more step. Um, so I'm maybe being a bit naughty, but whatever. So <laughs> so Jordan Peterson made a good point about how myths are yep. like. So what you would start by showing someone the action and then trying to get them to understand, like, I'd say the form is like an, act, an acted analogy. And then when you're telling yeah. myths, you're kind of, it's, you know, it's like a conceptual analogy. You're making them think of the actions rather than just showing them the action. Um, yeah. And so here's the naughty bit. My, what, what my impression has been that Mark and Manuel's idea of the parabolic you can see the connection myth and parable yeah. Yeah. is using it is basically as in fundamentally at core the same sort of thing as perspectival knowing and that there's not actually underlyingly any difference they're just stressing different aspects of it well that is naughty because uh, you know i've i've made arguments uh analogous to that that i don't think uh the parabolic um is unique it's i've talked about it as way of bridging between perspectival and participatory knowing um uh, the conversation i had with nick with nick wickelman about his use of analogy what in his book called the language of coaching uh comes to a very similar conclusion uh, and so i would basically i'm going to stand by the arguments i've made i've given uh the discord server you know a document around that um but you know that's kind of unfair to 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 Mark and Manuel because they're not in on this dialogue, and so I will just say that 
I still stand by, by my by the, the argument I've made for the reasons I've made. And therefore, I do find them convergent with the argument you've made and also convergent with, you know, the very powerful arguments that Nick Winkleman has made. And if you want to see the connections between his work and my work, I've, I've released a recent talk. I hope you guys invite Nick onto the Discord server, by the way. I think he'd be a fantastic person to have on here. So um, that's, as, that's as naughty as I will be. <laughs> okay, thanks, John. And kind of sorry to Mark and Manuel for just sort of... Yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to speak on their behalf. Um, uh, because they, they, of course, have always interacted with me in good faith. And I want to acknowledge that what just happened isn't meant to be some sneaky, or as he said, naughty way of claiming to have the final word on this um, this philia disagreement, which um, I think is part of any good community. Uh, there should be uh, these kinds of differences as people try to work out in good philia and good fellowship uh, the, 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 the best uh, interpretation uh, not only for themselves, but for the community as a whole. So I just want to speak like you did on behalf of Mark and Manuel. Uh, I am pleased as punch, and that may become clear later. But yes, thank you guys. I didn't feel unfairly treated or, or maligned at all. Okay, great. Thank you for saying that, Mark. That, uh, that makes me feel better. Thank you for saying that. It's important to me, as you know, I really, I really try to exemplify this. That you know, the the shared commitment to distributed cognition, um, and uh, the mutual respect and fellowship that it depends on is always given priority over any particular theoretical claim. All right, so we we have about five minutes left. So I think Jules had a question about the religion that's not a religion, and. Uh, and then Struan said he has 30 seconds uh, for, for a final <laughs> word. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, I, I, well, I doubt that, but, but, I, I'd like to, but I'm also interested to see if he can pull it off. So there you go. <laughs> so, well, I just really quickly wanted to, to give you the last reply. Um, I think your conversation with Alexander Bard really got into the depths of Logos the most. Um, I'm very, 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 very interested in a reinventio. Um, recapitulating and, and bringing everything that the Logos was meant to indicate with, but then also um, integrating that with mythos, so that it's Logos and mythos together. Yeah. Um, and that, that's basically, so you've got, the, you've got the, the intelligibility of Logos and the poetic, um, or the poesis of, of mythos, and that, yeah. that's how the two dovetail. And, and I, I like, but yes, yeah, um, yeah so, so that, that's, that's my overview with how respect, with respect to how I want to tie in your four kinds of knowing with the pole philosophical um, cultural tradition and everything. Well, well, thank you for that. I agree. I think that, and uh, and the person that we owe a lot of thanks to for that whole thing was Andrew Sweeney. Uh, setting it up and moderating it uh, was uh, was w was really important. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, I should, it was I should, a valuable conversation. Thank you. I think this. I think, yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. That that puts a, a sort of. Uh, you know, that puts sort of uh, a little note in my mind that I should uh, uh, approach Andrew about setting up one of those three-way discussions again. He wants next to have one between uh, uh, he and I and Zach Stein. Uh, so that's next, but maybe another one with Alexander would be good. I would like that. All right, and I, I don't well, know maybe how much... You and... Sorry, maybe you and Alexander Bard and Zach Stein together as a threesome would also be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting too. That would be very interesting. I'll have to think about that. Wow. Uh, it's just that Zach and Alexander have such different, almost diametrically opposite um, styles and, uh, and, and sort of presence of personality. I don't know if I'd be as good a moderator. Yeah, Velasco's not the only naughty one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think uh, Jules just had J Jules. We get the last question. Uh, yes, I don't. Hopefully, hopefully it's not too long a one. But uh, go go ahead, Jules, on the religion that's not a religion. Thanks, Brett, for remembering. Appreciate that. I, I think we're going to have to park it for next time. But I'll give you the outline. 
John, your religion, that's not a religion uh, suggestion, uh, is probably one of the most troubling aspects for me yeah. of your thought. Um, and I mean that very, very charitably uh, in that I, I take it to heart. It causes me some sleeplessness, et cetera. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll probably table this for the next one because I think it, it, it does deal with the sacred and things which are important to all of us, but, yes. uh, leave you with this where I've gotten up to with it. Uh, I, I think you're coming from it in the very, very best faith. I'm sure of that. Yes. Um, and I want to contrast John Viveki's religion that is not a religion tentative suggestion, which is what you said in episode 29, I think. Right. With August Comte's religion of yeah. humanity. Yeah, 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 very much. That's an argument that, uh, that Paul Vanderclay has made at one point. Yes. Okay. So maybe next time. I would very much like to answer that question next time. So very much. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was great. Uh, everyone had such great questions. And John, your answers are in-depth and thought-provoking as always. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Brett, for saying that. And I want to thank everybody. And um, I hope that all my interlocutors uh, felt well-treated and uh, that there was respect and caring. Um, uh, and, and so um, I certainly felt that on my part. And so I hope I reciprocated in true fellowship. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very, very much. You did. Thank you, John. Thanks. Brett. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, okay. John. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we'll, we'll see you. Uh, see you next time. I guess it'll be in about three weeks now uh, because we're we're a week late yeah. with this. So John will be back. Uh, it's the uh, I think it's the third Monday of of the of the month uh and john, yeah. john will be back and yeah w with more great questions and great answers <laughs> thank you for saying that and take good care everybody yes and everyone please tune in tomorrow we've got greg greg enriquez tomorrow uh we've got more to come in the weeks to come so please stay tuned and join us and i put links to our youtube and uh, discord calendar uh in the event text so everyone please mm -hmm. Uh, check out all the stuff we have going on and subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's, there's lots of material there and more to come.